Hi everyone. So for the last session of our semester, I just want to thank you all so much for all of your patience and being so accommodating through what was kind of an interesting semester in many ways. We were farther apart, there was a lot of conflict in the world, there was a lot of chaos, and I think everyone stayed connected to their practice and stayed enthusiastic for the learning process, and I really appreciate that. So thank you all so much. What we're going to do this session is summarize and review the whole semester and just kind of go through piece by piece and remember how all of it is linked. And so if nothing else, please remember that all phenomena are empty of inherent existence because they dependently arise. And that if we remember that, we will cut the root of samsara and we will break so many negative patterns in our daily life that give suffering to ourselves and others. So at least remember that, and then we'll go into some details now. Here we so go. we're in year three, semester B, Understanding Reality, part two, Tenants and Dependent Arising. We started the semester with a brief introduction to the premise of what tenants are, and a little bit of touching the idea of dependent arising. And we used these sources. We revisited the concept of the two truths, ultimate truth and conventional truth, explanations of the distinction between the two truths find a place in the assertions of each of the four tenant systems that are recognized by the Geluk order of Tibetan Buddhism as authentic formulations of Buddha's teachings. Just as a seal of a notary marks a document as authentic, these four systems each have four seals or views that mark them as authentic Buddhist doctrine. They all believe all products are impermanent. All contaminated things are miserable or suffering. All phenomena are selfless, empty. Nirvana is peace. All four Buddhist tenet systems, the Great Exposition, the Sutra, the Mind Only, the Middle Way, all of them adhere to the four seals, but their understanding of them varies in terms of subtlety. So after a brief introduction to the premise of tenants, then we went back to review some of the material from your previous semester, Understanding Reality Part 1. We reviewed from the previous semester and revisited this semester that concentration is an essential skill in overcoming negative states of mind and destructive habits, having consistent ethics of non-harmfulness, and a powerful, undistracted mind we can bring to our work to help vulnerable suffering people, as well as ourselves and all sentient beings. Shine is an essential ability we need to bring to our understanding of emptiness and dependent arising so that the root of samsara can be cut. We need the stability of shine, united with the knowledge and wisdom of reality, in order to do this. So we discuss the nine stages of mental abidance leading to shine in order to understand how to go about developing this type of concentration. The nine stages of sustained attention and six powers are explained in Asanga's Shravaka Grounds and Compendium of Knowledge, as well as Maitreya's Ornament of Mahayana Sutras. The nine stages of sustained concentration are stages of concentration on the way to serenity, a concentration arisen from meditation and accompanied by the bliss of mental and physical pliancy, in which the mind abides effortlessly, without fluctuation, for as long as we wish, on whatever object it has been placed. Synonyms for serenity, calm abiding, shamatha, shine, or single-pointed mindfulness meditation. So we looked at this image which describes the whole process the way in which at the bottom, the monastery represents renunciation, the determination to be free, 
intention to emerge. Leaving the monastery, starting the path, represents proficiency with the power of hearing. The monk is ourselves at each of the nine stages, the practitioner's progress towards Shine. The bends in the path represent the six powers, which are also represented elsewhere, the first bend being the power of familiarity. The hook that the monk holds is the power of introspective awareness, and the lasso, or rope, the power of mindfulness. These are our two weapons, or tools, or means to tame the mind. And these are the most essential components that we need on our path to developing sustained concentration. Up the center of the path, you have cloth, conch with perfume, fruit, symbols, and a mirror. And these represent the five sensory distractions that we battle against or try to transform our relationship with on our way to developing this kind of concentration. Other obstacles are described by the elephant, which represents coarse laxity, heaviness, sleepiness, difficulty in finding clarity. The monkey, restlessness and distraction, excitedness, The rabbit or hare, which doesn't appear until about halfway up the path, represents subtle laxity. And this is harder to catch, but is when the image is there or the focus is there, our concentration is there, but it's not sharp, it's last, lacking some clarity, and we're not able to maintain that bright vividness. The animals, the elephant, monkey, and rabbit, the color gradient changes and head's turn represents the process of gaining control over these obstacles. The fire, which is large at the beginning and gets smaller as you go up, represents the power of effort, strengthened by the power of familiarity. In the beginning, we need the most effort the most enthusiasm and intensity to keep ourselves going, but it gets easier as we go along the path. At the top of the path, we have the monk next to the sleeping elephant, which is the last of the nine stages. Then the monk who flies, representing Shine, has been achieved. We can focus on whatever we want, however we want, for as long as we want, without effort and the body and the mind are peaceful and blissful the whole time. After that, the form and formless realm meditative concentrations are also achieved, represented by the monk riding the elephants. So of all of those lists, the nine stages are important to know. The particular names you don't necessarily need to memorize, but to realize the way in which this is a process this is something that doesn't happen overnight, that you need habit and familiarity and consistency in order to develop. So at first you're placing the mind on the meditation object, whether it's the breath, whether it's a visualized image, whether it's the mind itself, whether it's an unanalytical concept, you place the mind and then continuously place the mind and replace the mind, and come closer with your placement, more specific. Then you tame the mind and pacify the mind, getting fewer and fewer distractions capturing your attention. Then thorough pacification, and single-pointedness, and setting an equipoise, the mind is finally under our control. So the monk at different locations on the path indicates the development of the nine stages of calm abiding serenity is flying and onto the form and formless realm, the elephant riders.
Without concentration, our self-cherishing continues to dominate our lives and perpetuate our distracted mind. Without wisdom, our self-grasping continues to color our appearances of ourselves, others, and everything in a false way. To access the wisdom of reality, we investigate dependent arising, which leads us to the review of the 12 links of dependent arising. This topic was introduced in the previous semester and elaborated in this semester to help deepen our understanding of cause and effect and how to break negative habits of many types and levels. It also brings us to a deeper level of wisdom and renunciation. We need to know the links in order to break the links. So this picture has been discussed in depth, the monster representing karma and disturbing emotions, impermanence and death, the Buddha pointing to the moon, reminding us to go to liberation enlightenment, and then the 12 links around the outer edge, six realms in the pie slices, the descent from high to low on the inner ring, and the core, or the battery, the three poisons, anger, attachment, and ignorance. Specifically, the 12 links we went into more depth, because the 12 links help us understand causation, cause and effect, the way karma operates, and the way in which nothing arises in and of itself alone, causelessly, which is an essential piece in changing our habit patterns. So there were the teaching order of the 12 links. There was the order of projecting projected, actualizing actualized. And there was also the grouping into karma, disturbing emotions, and suffering. So there was different arrangements of these 12 links to help us understand different ways to work with these concepts. So... Life and death and life, we talked about projecting factors, a set from a previous life, ignorance, karmic formation, causal consciousness, one, two, and three, are ripened by actualizing factors, craving, grasping, and becoming, eight, nine, and ten. leading to a new life at birth and the first part of aging, 11 and 12, which includes the projected results, 3B, the resultant consciousness, name and form, six sources, contact and feeling, 3 through 7. which then leads to the actualized 12B, or the second part of 12, which is death, where 8, 9, and 10 ripen a set of 1, 2, and 3A for 11, 12A, 3B, 4, 5, 6, and 7, etc., etc., etc. So projecting factors are ignorance, karmic formations, and causal consciousness. Projected, resultant consciousness, name and form, which is the five aggregates, six sources, meaning the six sense powers, contact, meeting of outside, inside, and in between ish, feeling, mental or physical experience of pleasant, unpleasant, or neutrality. The actualizing are the habit patterns we want to stop doing. So actualizing is craving and grasping, attachment wanting to have and keep pleasure objects, and to be separated from aversion objects. Grasping being escalated, desirous attachment, wanting to have and keep pleasure objects, and to be separated from aversion objects that are seen as repulsive. These two are the ripening agents 
of past karmic seeds to become or project a new lifetime. So the third actualizing factor is becoming, which is also known as potential or renewed existence. This is karma becoming rebirth. Then what are actualized is birth, meaning rebirth, for humans, the moment of conception, and aging and death. Aging begins the second moment after conception, all the way to death. So we look at this framework in order to understand some things about causation. It's a useful format to group them, but you don't have to remember particularly, except for to know that there are some things that are ripeners and there are some things that are ripened. There's some things that are more active and some things that are referred to a finished product. The other categorization was the 12 links into these three groups. So ignorance, craving, and grasping can be classed as afflictions, which are sometimes translated as disturbing emotions or negative states of mind. You can group consciousness, name and form, six sources, contact, feeling, birth, aging and death. You can call all of these suffering. And karma refers to the second link, karmic formations, and the tenth link, becoming potential existence. So the reason that we group them in this way is really to look at not just lifetime after lifetime, but our everyday experience of habit patterns. This is how we understand how to, in a daily way, really break the links. So you break the link between suffering and afflictions by applying lojong, mind training techniques, or rejoicing and exhausting negative karma and not responding badly, creating new. You can practice tonglen, taking and giving meditation. But basically what you're doing is some sort of radical reframe of pain. You're trying not to let pain turn into an afflicted state of mind. You're breaking the association between suffering and reacting badly or harmfully because of it. Now we might miss that window. So then we look at breaking the link between afflictions or negative states of mind, disturbing emotions, and creating negative karma. Here you can also apply lojong, mind training techniques, or like Shanti Deva says, remain like a block of wood. So just shut up, keep your hands to yourself, don't write any emails, don't send any text messages, and wait for it to pass. You remember that suffering comes from negative karma to self and others, and so you might feel the grumpiness, the negative state of mind, the agitation, but you're choosing not to act from that place. You're choosing not to give in. You're choosing not to believe the story of your disturbing emotions. And in that way, you prevent yourself from creating negative karma. If you miss that window and your disturbing emotions have led you to do the wrong thing, you can stop that karmic seed from blossoming or ripening or sprouting. You can stop karma from becoming suffering. So to break the link between karma and suffering, purification is essential. Vajrasattva practice with the four opponent powers or meditation on the emptiness of inherent existence, seeing the way the agent, the action, and the object are all empty because they dependently arise, this is a very powerful way to break this link. So this is the key of everyday life practice as well as practicing from life to life to life. And this framing of the 12 links is very important if you can at least remember the three main headings, suffering, afflictions, and karma and the way to break the associations with each of those links. If you can't remember all the subcategories and the way the 12 links fall under them, that's okay. But if you can really try to remember 
that there are methods to break negative patterns at every juncture. So when we look at the 12 links of dependent arising in this semester, ignorance is our main project. Because if we can get rid of ignorance and stop ignorance, all of the rest of them will fall apart as well. So this applied to the section in Breaking the Links, when you're looking at meditation on the emptiness of inherent existence, you're trying to cut the ignorance that believes the opposite of that. So ignorance is key, and that's why we study tenets. So as Lama Zopa Rinpoche says, Buddha taught varying levels of philosophy to guide sentient beings' minds gradually up to the level where they could realize the prasangika view of emptiness. One could start with the gross explanations of emptiness taught by the lower schools and gradually progress up to the most subtle, the prasangika. That's how the four schools came into being. The lower schools were steps to the higher ones, leading ultimately to the prasangika. So even though the views of these very schools seem to contradict each other, actually they're a method for gradually developing, through study and meditation, the prasangika view. So again, the four schools of Buddhist philosophy are Vibhashika, the Great Exposition, Sotrantika, the Sutra, Chittamatra, the Mind Only, and Madhyamaka, the Middle Way. The fourth of these, the Middle Way school, is divided into two, Svatantrika, the Middle Way Autonomous, and Prasangika, the Middle Way Consequence. So in Lama Tsongkhapa's root verse on a praise of dependent arising, he says, How could your system be understood by those who perceive the way of interdependent arising contrarily or as non-existent? So this is Lama Tsongkhapa speaking to the lower tenant schools. Geshe-la's commentary says, The Buddha said that a thing being a dependent arising proves its lack of inherent existence. But there are lower Buddhist tenant schools, the realists, for example, the Great Exposition and the Sutra School, who believe the exact opposite, that because things are dependent arising, they are inherently existent. These lower Buddhist tenant holders are thus referred to as those who perceive the way of interdependent arising contrarily. Those who perceive interdependent arising as non-existent refers to non-Buddhists who say dependent arising does not exist at all, holding that phenomena do not have the nature of dependent arising. Lama Tsongkhapa questions how both the lower Buddhist tenet holders who believe the exact opposite, that dependent arising means things inherently exist, and the non-Buddhists who do not believe in dependent arising at all, could understand the Buddhist system. The understanding of dependent arising is the indispensable method for realizing emptiness. And without realizing emptiness, there is no method to remove all the delusions from their root and achieve the final goal. Let us understand why these lower Buddhist tenant schools believe that dependent arising means that things inherently exist. And so that goes on to a discussion of the Great Exposition School and the Sutra School and the way they believe that there is a fundamental partless particle upon which all things are based. And there's a kind of logic to that. Maybe there's a, a sense that something has to start from a tangible something. So, you know, there's a lot of ways to refute that and say that that's not the case, but it can be useful for some people's minds to start there. So skipping to the Prasangika view, we look at dependent arising. Dependence refers to meeting, 
reliance upon, a non-independent type of existence. Arising relates to how phenomena come into existence. The types and levels of dependent arising are described below. The king of reasons is that all phenomena are empty of inherent existence because they dependently arise. Dependence is described in three levels, and this is how we prove it to ourselves. This is how we come to understand it experientially, is to use this logic and to really sit with it. So causal dependency, all impermanent phenomena, rely on causes and conditions in order to arise, function, etc. Mutual dependency, all impermanent phenomena and permanent phenomena rely on parts and whole and context in order to be understood, used, viewed, etc. And merely label dependency, all impermanent and permanent phenomena rely on a valid basis of designation and a mind's imputation to exist, to be held in awareness, be engaged with, etc. So this page, this summary, is very important. These levels of dependent arising are your access into emptiness. And once you realize emptiness, you can stop all the other problems and suffering and harm. So this is a very important one to really get into your mind very clearly. I think it's important to understand that there are other tenant schools, lower tenant schools, that have a different idea of this. But if we skip to the most subtle, this highest view, and see if it makes sense to you, see how you might apply it to your daily life. The other tenant schools are kind of interesting intellectual exercises, but here is where the direct experience of daily life, we want to bring our logic in using these methods. So then there's two levels of mistake in appearance. To realize that the reflection in the mirror does not exist as an actual face, we have to realize that the reflection does not exist as it appears. So that reflection has two appearances. Its appearance as a face, which is incorrect, which is a coarse appearance. We see a face, but there's not actually another face there. And two, its appearance as self-existence, which is its subtle appearance, which is a much deeper mistake than just believing a reflection to be another face. When we realize the reflection is empty of existing as a face as it appears, we realize it is empty of its coarse appearance. At that time, we have not even come close to negating its subtle mistaken appearance. Its appearance is truly existent. When we realize the reflection is empty of true existence as it appears, we realize its subtle emptiness. Similarly, when the sky is clear on a full moon night, the form of the moon will appear reflected in a still body of water though there is no moon in the water as there appears to be. Likewise, things are not existent from their own side, as they appear, because if they were, when we searched for them, in their basis of designation, we would find them. And so then the ignorance that is the root of samsara is this thought that believes the eye is not merely labeled, but has an existence from its own side, is the root of samsara. Just the thought that believes this to be true is the root of samsara. The wrong conceptions that believe the eye to be permanent or to exist alone or with its own freedom without depending on the continuation of the aggregates are not the root of samsara. After the label I has been given, 
when the continuation of this thought starts to believe that the I has an existence from its own side, this is the root of samsara. What makes the I, which is merely imputed, appear truly existent? Our past ignorance left an imprint on our mental continuum, and this imprint is projected, like a projector projecting a film, onto a screen or a TV channel showing people fighting, dancing, or doing other things. The imprint left on our mental continuum, by past ignorance, projects or decorates true existence onto the merely imputed eye. We see a concrete eye, and that is what the imprint left by ignorance has projected onto the mere eye. That part is a complete hallucination. The concrete eye isn't there at all. So then the stages by which you enter into that reality, the reality of wisdom in this case, first, having contemplated in dismay the faults and disadvantages of cyclic existence, you should develop a wish to be done with it. Then, understanding that you will not overcome it unless you overcome its cause, you research its roots, considering what might be the root cause of cyclic existence. You will thereby become certain from the depths of your heart that the reifying view of the perishing aggregates or innate ignorance acts as the root of cyclic existence. You then need to develop a sincere wish to eliminate that. Next, see that overcoming the reifying view of the perishing aggregates depends upon developing the wisdom that knows that the self, as thus conceived, does not exist. You will then see that you have to refute that self. Be certain in that refutation, relying upon scriptures and lines of reasoning that contradict its existence and prove its non-existence. This is an indispensable technique for anyone who seeks liberation. After you have thus arrived at the philosophical view that discerns that the self and that which belongs to the self lack even a shred of intrinsic nature, you should accustom yourself to that. This will then lead to the attainment of the embodiment of truth, direct perceptual realization of emptiness. So the first two schools, the Vaibhashika, Great Exposition School, and the Satrantika, Sutra School, searched for the basic building block of the universe, and because these basic particles were seen as truly existent, these two schools are known as realist schools. These two schools assert only the selflessness of persons, not the selflessness of phenomena. The third school, the Chittamatra Mind Only School, the intrinsic reality of external objects is questioned. It is argued that whereas the mind is real, the objects perceived by the mind cannot have independent existence because of that very reliance on the mind to ascertain them. So it's two different angles which aren't quite hitting the mark, but have some interesting ideas in them. Finally, there is the Madhyamaka Middle Way School, the fourth, and so our tradition considers highest or most subtle school. The Madhyamaka view is the middle way because its position lies between what it sees as the eternalism of the first two schools, Great Exposition and Sutra, that sees objects as existing from their own side, and the nihilism of the Chittamatra school, mind-only school, that asserts that things and events have no reality at all. That's how the two extremes are framed in terms of the tenet schools. Yeah, eternalism is the direction that the first two schools go into. They go too far in trying to find the middle way into eternalism or absolutism. 
which is also called the extreme of permanence. The mind-only school goes into the extreme of nihilism. So they're all three aiming for the middle way, but none of them quite touch it until they get to the middle way consequentialists. So avoiding extremes through disproving them, which is done through negation, canceling, contradicting, disproving two main errors, the extreme of permanence, which refers to absolutism, eternalism, and the extreme of annihilation, which refers to nihilism. Negating the extreme of permanence or eternalism, saying that something is dependent, negates the idea that it could exist under its own power. So this is the way the reasoning of dependent arising disproves or cancels the extreme of permanence. If something is dependent, it cannot exist under its own power. Take, for example, something dependent on causes and conditions to come about. Without those causes and conditions, such a thing could not exist, and therefore it does not exist under its own power. Thus, to say something is dependent negates completely the possibility that something could be independent or come into existence under its own power. The three understandings of dependence, things being dependent on causes and conditions, on the parts and the whole, and on being merely labeled by the mind, negate the idea that things could exist under their own power. In this way, the idea that things are dependent negates the extreme view of permanence. Negating the extreme of annihilation or nihilism, the idea that things arise negates the other extreme view, nihilism. So the two words, dependent arising or dependent origination, are not accidental. Both words point to a negation that's key. This wrong view maintains that because something is empty of inherent existence, it is therefore completely non-existent. This is not true, because even though something is empty of inherent existence, it still arises in dependence on causes and conditions, parts, and being merely labeled by the mind. Things arise, and they do exist. So what we want to understand here then is what is the middle way? How is it that things are dependent? How is it that things arise and are neither not existent in and of themselves nor non-existent altogether? And so we use the fourfold analysis related to the self specifically because that is our main work. So we have to first recognize the problem. Just like you can't know if there is an elephant in the room unless you know what an elephant is. You can't say for certain what isn't there unless you know what isn't is referring to. So we have to recognize the object to be negated or refuted. We have to see the way the self seems, especially when it's under threat, when it's held up in positive regard, when it's in danger, when it's criticized, when it's overly celebrated, when it feels concrete. You hold that idea and say, were you to exist as you seem, so solid, so real, such an identity, such a truth, then you must be one with your parts or separate than your parts. You must be the same as your aggregates or different than your aggregates. And that makes sense because we all agree that a self is somehow composed of parts or owns parts or makes parts, but we know we have different aspects and attributes and different things that we refer to when we say me. 
So what is the relationship between this me and the parts? Has to be oneness or difference. So we look at the lack of oneness or sameness of the I and the aggregates by thinking about the absurdity. If the I and the aggregates were the same, then the I and the aggregates would be joined up or merged and it would be like there were multiple I's, multiple selves. Then we look at the absurdity of separateness of the I and the aggregates. The lack of separateness of I and the aggregates are different to I and the aggregates. If I and the aggregates were fundamentally different to each other, it would be like a puppeteer and a puppet, a controller and what is controlled, a boss and a servant. There would be this kind of relationship of dominance and submission. And it would be like there was a sixth aggregate or some additional component that was not having the same characteristics as the aggregates. And whenever you look for that, you cannot find it. So with canceling number three and number four, you come to see that number two is pointing you to the fact that if it can't exist in those two ways, then it can't exist at all. So that object to be negated then actually becomes negated. You conclude, therefore, there is no inherent self. You find the non-finding of that. So then you go back and you make sure you're not going crazy and you remember how mere labeling and the criteria for a valid base are things that you can hang your hat on or be certain of. Mere labeling on a valid basis is the subtlest level of understanding dependent arising. Mere labeling is the process of designating phenomena. Valid basis, what one can attribute labels onto in an accurate way. And this keeps us out of the extreme of nihilism. So if you find the non-finding of the inherently existent self, then you have to conclude the only self that exists is an imputedly existent self or a merely labeled self on a valid basis. In order to not make mere labeling on a valid basis too concrete or veer into inherence again, then you have to unpack these ideas. There are three kinds of mind that can harm or invalidate the existence of what appears to be, for example, a bell. So a valid basis has to be in accordance with another person's valid conventional mind be in accordance with an omniscient mind, be in accordance with the wisdom realizing emptiness under analysis of the ultimate. Mere labeling refers to the function, the shape, the ability, basically worldly convention. What causes us to label things positive or negative? What's the force behind all this? It's karma. Because of past karma, some people are able to label things positively, while others have to label them negatively. The underlying cause is karma. Therefore, you can see how crucial it is to purify past negative karma and not to create any more. In other words, how essential it is to practice dharma. And so then we can loop back around to the 12 links of dependent arising and see how it all fits together from this deeper perspective. Ignorance, holding the concept of true existence, is like a farmer. Karma, the action motivated by this ignorance, is like a field in which various types of crops can grow. And consciousness, on which karma leaves all the imprints, is like the seed. One tiny seed carries all the potential to grow a huge tree with many billions of branches that cover a huge area. Like a seed, the consciousness on which karma left all the imprints contains all the potential. The consciousness continued from your past life to this life and will continue from this life to your next life, carrying all these imprints. 
the imprint left by karma on the consciousness is then made ready to bring its own rebirth, its own future samsara, the aggregates, by craving and grasping, which are like the minerals. That is called becoming, which is like a seed becoming ready to produce its sprout. The next life or rebirth starts with name and form, which is like the sprout grown from the seed. After that comes the sense bases, contact, feeling, and then old age and death. The conclusion is that from morning till night, from birth until death, whatever happiness and suffering we experience, and whatever good or bad objects appear to us, they all come from our consciousness, which carries all the imprints. Everything that appears to us from birth until death comes from our own consciousness. All the different experiences we have of people, places, and sense objects comes from our consciousness, which carries the imprints. It is not only that everything that appears to us today and from birth until death comes from our consciousness, but also that the whole appearance of samsara comes from consciousness, which is just our own mind. Not only that, but it comes from karma, which is also our own mind. And so truth exists, but there is nothing that exists truly. That sounds odd to say at first, but when we understand the meaning, it makes sense. Truth does exist because emptiness is true and because ultimate truth is true. Emptiness is true because it is the meaning discovered by the wisdom of meditative equipoise of an aria directly realizing emptiness. It is also true because it is undeceiving in the way that its way of appearing and its way of existing are in harmony. And so just keep thinking about dependent arising, the meaning of dependent arising, the way it saves us from the extremes, the way it points us in the right direction, all the different levels of it. These levels of dependent arising are your access into emptiness. And once you realize emptiness, you can stop all the other problems and suffering and harm. Okay, so that's the story and I'm sticking to it. I hope it's making sense. Um, keep reading the text that you've been given. Just slowly, slowly it will become more and more clear. And I'm looking forward to seeing you at the retreat.